Welcome to this video on institutional invisibility and language revitalization in Japan. My name is Jofia Hidvigi from Atlas Florent University, Budapest, Hungary. First and foremost, I would like to say thank you, Mahalo Neiloa, to the organizer committee for this opportunity and the exceptional great work. Let's start with a quick overview of this presentation. Today, I'm going to talk about the Ainu and the Ryukyuan revitalization movement with a focus on how the Ryukyuan community are managing their program, despite the fact that there is no direct national support for revitalizing their languages. Unfortunately, because of the time limit of the presentation, I cannot go into details about the independent civilian programs, uh, which I've been monitoring for the past 10 years. First, I would like to talk about the endangered languages of Japan, the degree of endangerment, the status and overall governmental language policy of Japan. Then I will introduce the Ainu language revitalization movement and its organizational development under a more centralized governmental language management setup. Then I will talk about the Ryukyuan revitalization movement and introduce the initiatives of the local government. And finally, I will explain how the institutional invisibility have to keep the independency and self-managing nature of the language revival movement. Japan is widely considered as a monolingual and monoethnic nation. However, the myth of ethnically and linguistically homogeneous country was born during the creation of the modern nation state during the Meiji period. The Japanese language or Kokugo served as a unitary language for the empire and strengthened the cohesion of its citizens. The enforcement of an official language was one of the many tools to, to assimilate the different ethnic communities during the expansion of the great Japanese empire. Because of the strong and often time forceful standardization measures, the minority communities shifted to the dominant Japanese culture and their heritage language became endangered. And even after the Second World War, where the radical national policy changed to a more liberal one, the monoethnic and monolingual beliefs remained. Only the photosetal phenomenon, the nostalgia for oftentimes fictional hometown or home region could break the hegemony of the standard Japanese language and create a need for the other language varieties, although it was too late for the advanced language shift in most of the cases of the, the minority languages. According to the UNESCO, the Ainu language or languages, if we consider the great difference between the Northern and the Southern varieties are severely endangered, if not dormant already. Four of the six Ryukyuan languages, the Amami, the Miyako, Konigami and Okinawan languages are definitely endangered. The Yayama and the Yonaguni languages are severely endangered. However, based on my fieldwork research, all of the Rukyan languages can be considered as so. And we should consider the endangerment of the true Creole languages of the region as well. In most recent time, Japan has shown more openness to the multiculturalism and to the acknowledgement of the right of the indigenous people and voted yes at the United Nations Assembly on the Declaration on the Rights of the Indigenous People in 2007. Following by a long process of change in the domestic legislation about the rights of the indigenous Ainu people to the culture and language. So, Let's look at the changes in the language management in the case of the Ainu language. During the monolingual ideological era, the language policy making was under the Ministry of Education, Culture and Science, the later MEXT. And there was no space for indigenous language in official or formal settings. The Ainu people's battles for recognition began with the protest in the um, 1960s and more radical incidents in the 1970s. The goal of the political actions of the Ainu activists were to regain the equal rights to the wealth and resources of the society. They did not accept the stereotype of the dying culture, uh, nor the assimilation policy of uh, the Japanese government. Finally, 
the Japanese state acknowledged them first in uh, a UN report in 1991 as an ethnic minority. And in 1997, the Japanese territorial system not only accepted the legal term of indigenous people, but declared the Ainu people fit to this category. By recognizing the Ainu as indigenous people of Japan, they acknowledged the right to their land, culture and languages. The government supported the new indigenous status by adjusting the legislation system and enacted the Ainu Cultural Promotion Act on 1st of July in 1997, which were followed by several readjustments and the latest one uh, in 2019. The goal of the law was to protect and promote the Ainu culture, which includes their languages as well. In 1997, the MAX and the Hokkaido Bureau of Ministry of Land, Infrastructure, Transport and Tourism established a foundation for research and promotion uh, of Ainu culture, uh, FRPAC in short, which handles the Ainu language. The Hokkaido Utari Kyokai, a non-governmental organization which had connection to the civilian movement and originally was related to the uh, central policy makers as well, submitted a proposal which included a plan for education and protection of the Ainu languages, but it didn't really go through the centralized system. The issue is that the Act only declared the languages as part of the Ainu culture, it did not give any further indication of on language education or management. The governmental institute, the FRPAC, has left little to no space for the local community in self-determination and management in regard of the languages. The foundation created a standard language variation for increasing the effectiveness of the, the language transmission programs, ignoring the linguistic and cultural variety of the Ainu people and created an inequality among the cultural subgroups. It is true that there are only a handful of native speakers and the language ship is almost complete at this point. The communities has very few trained people in language education or in language revitalization methods. But the problem is the indigenous community are basically excluded from the decision making process. In the case of the Ryukyuan people, however, during the, the liberal monolingual language policy after the Second World War, the phenomenon of the Furuseto nostalgia helped the local languages because the trend secured enough validation for them, strengthened the civilian activism on the islands. The centralized language policy allowed the existence of the Ryukyuan languages as long as they remained dialects or lesser versions uh, of the great Japanese language. And it even had the prestige of the local less ethnic Creole languages to a certain degree. After the administration change in 1972, the local activism started a movement for not only a cultural reinvigoration, but also language revitalization. Their self-organizing nature followed a bottom-to-top management approach, creating a very diverse and a more equal setup for revising the language shift, which is also not as advanced in the, as in the case in, of the Ainus. In the, in the 2000s, the local government body, the Okinawan Prefectural Government, OPG for short, joined the local movement and set up a committee for the maintenance and promotion of the local languages. And while they officially belong to the national administrative system, they treat the local language varieties as independent languages under the umbrella term of Shimakutoba or the languages of the island. They created a, a center for managing the language revitalization programs, but without enforcing a rigid and one sided national minority language policy. Up to this day, the Ryukyuan languages are considered as dialects. So there is no reason for the national administration to take over the task of the language management on the island. Therefore, the Shima Kutuba Center can operate quite automatically and uh, can and does cooperate with the independent civil activists. And despite the lack of the acknowledgement and governmental funding, the Ryukyuan people managed to organize 
a diverse and wide range of revival program. In contrary to the national policy on the minority cultures, the local government involvement doesn't stop in vague and unclear declarations. They acknowledged the importance of the local languages and designated the 18th of September for the celebration of the languages in 2006, supporting the, the restoration of the prestige of the language varieties. To follow up the decision on supporting the revitalization, they created a general 10-year revival action plan with regular self-check system. At first glance, the OPG initiatives seems to follow a more classical approach to the language maintenance and act like a central and leading managing body for the language revitalization programs. The Shima Futaba Center, which members are seen on the right, uh, could be the, the proxy for the OPG and its policy, and it could control the language revival by the language education trainings, but the independent initiatives and activists are still rather influential in the decision-making process. Although there is definitely a, a, a stronger preference of the ok Okinawan language, the OPG tries to keep the, uh, a neutral setup to enable the different language communities to feel included. For example, by choosing the Shima Kutuba uh, umbrella term for the, the official movement, which logo is on the right, uh, or by editing teaching materials in all the local languages. They are not only supporting the language transmission, uh, but trying to change the social profile of the languages by resorting the prestige and require the public servants to use the language uh, greetings at first and, uh, and reclaim their linguistic landscape by placing out placards uh, in Shima Kutuba. Naturally, there are some friction and issues between the civil movement and the local government. However, under the current national language policy, the OPG has the opportunity to create a platform where a prestigious government body cooperate with the activists from the local language communities. They are not bound by the classical top to bottom policy making process, and they uh, keep on focusing on, on language management on the, the local level. It is true that with the involvement of the OPG, the revitalization movement could switch to a more unified and therefore standardized path. But right now, it is offering the management of a network for activists, academics, participants, supporters, and they are respecting the language and the cultural diversity by letting the language communities to organize themselves uh, to find their own solutions for their culture specific linguistics problem. The governmental body can also help in the large scale education about language endangerment and the rights to, to the culture and to the language of the local indigenous people and help to restore the prestige of the languages by securing an, a regional uh, uh, and safe uh, environment. If the positive attitude strengthen towards the heritage languages. There is space for their use and their communities involved in the decision-making process. There is more chance that the participants of the civil movement keep on being motivated in the language use and transmission as well. In summary, the governmental acknowledgement and support are not necessarily the only way for a successful revitalization we can see how a seemingly disadvantageous language setting can actually help the language revitalization. If the political setup is not hostile and there are motivated local revival activists, a mid-level government body can secure a network platform for a segmented revival movement by its prestige without excluding the various language communities and it can support the reclamation and restoration of the indigenous language despite the lack of national acceptance. We reach the end of 
the presentation. This is a short selected list of my uh, secondary sources. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, I care. I pay you for the bitan. Listen up.